In Morse, each letter is represented by a combination of dots and dashes, long and short electrical impulses. But within a few years, cable had a serious rival. The ancient university city of Bologna in Italy likes to boast of her highly charged atmosphere, just the place for inventors like Marconi, her most famous son. Even today, radio operators are known in Italy as Marconisti. From an early age, Marconi was fascinated by electricity. Working with leading researchers, he carefully built up the knowledge he needed for his inventions. He could never have done this with a conventional college education. His Irish mother brought her children up to speak English as well as Italian, and they were a musical family too. Giulielmo played the piano. While on holiday at the age of 20, he read an article on the experiments carried out by the German physicist Heinrich Hertz. This gave him a clear goal to aim at, the transmission of messages by means of electromagnetic waves. A spark jumps across the gap between two live wires. It emits electromagnetic radiation. This causes a second spark in the receiver. The radiation spreads out in all directions, like light waves. This phenomenon was at the heart of Hertz's research. At the same time, Alexander Popov in Russia was performing experiments on atmospheric electricity. He developed the rod antenna for use in his thunderstorm warning device. In France, Edouard Branly invented the coherer, a more efficient form of receiver. It consists of iron filings in a tube. They cohere when a signal is received, thus closing an electrical circuit. Marconi installed a tapper in this device to shake the filings apart again, preparing them for the next signal. With his goal now clear, Marconi worked like a man possessed at the top of his parents' villa. His father thought it all a lot of nonsense, a waste of time, but his mother believed in him and even brought his meals to the laboratory. After two years, he managed to get an electric bell to ring from a distance of nine metres, and using a metal sheet antenna, succeeded in transmitting Morse code signals. The metal sheet was soon replaced by a wire antenna, which he set up in the garden. This enabled him to transmit across greater distances using longer wavelengths. When he discovered the principle of grounding or earthing, the range jumped to several hundred metres at a stroke. Now, for the first time, he tried to transmit beyond the range of visibility. His brother took a rifle. He was to fire it if he received the signal. An assistant carried the receiver. Off they went, two and a half kilometres. On the table was his well-tried equipment. The Morse key, the balls for the spark gap, the induction coil, the battery. He was the first to use the same antenna for both transmission and reception. He tapped out three short impulses with the Morse key. They caused three sparks to jump, producing the electromagnetic waves. The proud result? His signals went through forests, walls, fog, night, and over mountains and across seas. The electric current causes the electrons in the antenna to vibrate. They generate the radio wave. But in Marconi's early days, no one knew about electrons. Italy showed little interest in the invention, so Marconi went to Britain. With its enormous navy, Britain might be able to make good use of wireless transmission, he thought. The post office engineers, though sceptical, gave him support. Using antennas suspended from flying kites, Marconi soon achieved a range of 15 kilometres over water and sent the first wireless telegrams. The King of Italy suddenly woke up and sent for the 24-year-old King of the Airwaves. A number of Italian warships were equipped with his apparatus.
the frequency spectrum was still very broad, but it was adequate for summoning assistance, for example. Word spread that ships with Marconi equipment were safer. The most urgent problem was to find a way of filtering the actual message out of a jumble of waves. Steady improvements in the receivers, allowing accurate tuning, enabled transmitters and receivers to function more reliably. Alongside the equipment, Marconi also hired out the radio operator, an entirely new trade. He imposed one condition. Messages could only be sent to his stations, an effective monopoly. Altogether, Marconi held 800 wireless telegraphy patents. Radio was first used in crime detection when wife murderer Dr. Crippen was arrested on a steamer on his way to America. The wireless signal had got there first. When the Titanic sank, 700 passengers owed their lives to the SOS message broadcast by the ship's radio operator. After this disaster, emergency frequencies were agreed worldwide. Cartoonists showed Marconi bartering for souls with King Neptune. Eleven years earlier, Marconi had secretly prepared his attempt to bridge the Atlantic. At Paul Du, on the coast of southwest England, he built the biggest transmitting station yet seen. It took a year to complete, but he told no one what he planned. The antennas were damaged by winter storms, but at 12.30, one December day in 1901, he reported the weak reception of signals from 3,200 kilometers across the Atlantic. His diary listed only the frequencies and, hardly legible, the times of reception. The sober record of a sensational feat by which he proved those scientists wrong who maintained that the radio waves would go off into space in a straight line. But long waves, with a wavelength of between 1,000 and 10,000 metres, go no higher than the ionosphere. The Earth's conductivity means they follow the curvature of the globe. <laughs> 